This is one of the most important videos I've ever made. You have to realize that there's a war going on on human health. We don't know what makes us healthy anymore. We're not taught about what makes us healthy. And, more importantly, we don't know what to eat. There's a big war on nutrition information and everybody seems to be confused when the answer is actually quite simple. And after watching this video, you'll realize how simple it is. The evidence presented in this video comes from the book Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston A. Price. More on Weston A. Price and his book later. Now, let's take a look at the diets of our ancestors. These are various quotes from chapter 15 in Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Characteristics of Primitive and Modernized Dietaries. We find that for the people in the high and isolated alpine valleys, their nutrition is dependent largely on entire rye bread and dairy products, with meat about once a week, and various vegetables, fresh in the summer season and stored for the winter season. An analysis in my laboratory of the dairy products obtained from the Lochental Valley in Switzerland through a series of years has shown the vitamin content to be much higher than the average throughout the world for similar foods during the same seasons. The milk in these valleys is produced from green pasturage and stored green hay of exceptionally high chlorophyll content. The milk and the rye bread provided minerals abundantly. The diet of the people in the Outer Hebrides consisted chiefly of oat products and seafoods, including the wide variety of fish available there. This diet included generally no dairy products since the pasture was not adequate for maintaining cattle. Oat grain was the only cereal that could be matured satisfactorily in that climate. Some green foods were available in the summer and some vegetables were grown and stored for the winter. This diet, which included a liberal supply of fish, included also the use of livers of fish. One important fish dish was baked cod's head that had been stuffed with oatmeal and chopped cod's livers. This was an important inclusion in the diets of the growing children. The oats and the fish, including livers, provided minerals and vitamins adequate for an excellent racial stock with high immunity to tooth decay. For the Eskimos of Alaska, the native diet consisted of a liberal use of organs and other special tissues of the large animal life of the sea, as well as of fish. The latter were dried in large quantities in the summer and stored for winter use. The fish were also eaten frozen. Seal oil was used freely as an adjunct to this diet, and seal meat was specially prized and was usually available. Caribou meat was sometimes available. The organs were used. Their fruits were limited largely to a few berries, including cranberries, available in the summer and stored for winter use. Several plant foods were gathered in the summer and stored in fat or frozen for winter use. A ground nut that was gathered by the tundra mice and stored in caches was used by the Eskimos as a vegetable. Stems of certain water grasses, water plants, and bulbs were occasionally used. The bulk of their diet, however, was fish and large animal life of the sea from which they selected certain organs and tissues with great care and wisdom. These included the inner layer of skin of one of the whale species, which has recently been shown to be very rich in vitamin C. Fish eggs were dried in season. They were used liberally as food for the growing children and were recognized as important for growth and reproduction. This successful nutrition provided ample amounts of fat-soluble activators and minerals from sea animal life. For the Indians living inside the Rocky Mountain range in the far north of Canada, the successful nutrition for nine months of the year was largely limited to wild game, chiefly moose and caribou. During the summer months, the Indians were able to use growing plants. During the winter, some use was made of bark and buds of trees. I found the Indians putting great emphasis upon the eating of the organs of the animals, including the wall of parts of the digestive tract. Much of the muscle meat of the animals was fed to the dogs. It is important that skeletons are rarely found where large game animals have been slaughtered by the Indians of the north. The skeletal remains are found as piles of finely broken bone chips or splinters that have been cracked up to obtain as much as possible of the marrow and nutritive qualities of the bones. These Indians obtain their fat-soluble vitamins and also most of their minerals from the organs of the animals. An important part of the nutrition of the children consisted in various preparations of bone marrow, both as a substitute for milk and as a special dietary ration. In the various archipelagos of the South Pacific and in the islands north of Australia, the natives depended greatly on shellfish and various scalefish from adjacent seas. These were eaten with an assortment of plant roots and fruits, raw and cooked. Taro was an important factor in the nutrition of most of these groups. It is the root of a species of lily. In several of the islands, the tender young leaves of this plant were eaten with coconut cream baked in the leaf of the tia plant. 
In the Hawaiian group of islands, the taro plant is cooked and dried and pounded into a powder and then mixed with water and allowed to ferment for 24 hours, more or less, in accordance with the stiffness of the product desired. This is called poi. Its use in this form was comparable in efficiency with its use on other archipelagos as a boiled root served much as we use potatoes. For these South Sea Islanders, fat-soluble vitamins and many of the minerals were supplied by the shellfish and other animal life from the sea. The native tribes in Eastern and Central Africa used large quantities of sweet potatoes, beans and some cereals. Where they were living sufficiently near freshwater streams and lakes, large quantities of fish were eaten. Goats or cattle or both were domesticated by many tribes. Other tribes used wild animal life quite liberally. Some very unique and special sources of vitamins were used by some of these tribes. For example, in certain seasons of the year, great swarms of a large winged insect developed in Lake Victoria and other lakes. These often accumulated on the shores to a depth of many inches. They were gathered, dried, and preserved to be used in puddings, which are highly prized by the natives and are well spoken of by the missionaries. Another insect source of vitamins used frequently by the natives is the ant, which is collected from great ant hills that in many districts grow to heights of 10 feet or more. We were told by the missionaries that one of the great luxuries was an ant pie. Africa, like many other districts, are often plagued by vast swarms of locusts. These are gathered in large quantities to be cooked for immediate use or dried and ground into a flour for later use. They provide a rich source of minerals and vitamins. The natives used the cereals maize, beans, lingalinga, millet, and kaffir corn. Most of these were ground just before cooking. Among the aborigines of Australia, we found that those living near the sea were using animal life from that source liberally, together with the native plants and animals of the land. They have not cultivated the land plants during their primitive life. In the interior, they use freely the wild animal life, particularly wallaby, kangaroo, small animals, and rodents. All of the edible parts, including the walls of the viscera and internal organs, are eaten. The native Maori in New Zealand used large quantities of foods from the sea, wherever these were available. Even in the inland food depots, mutton birds were still available in large quantities. These birds were captured just before they left their nests. They developed in the rockeries about the coast, chiefly on the extreme southern coast of the South Island. At this stage, the flesh is very tender and very fat from the gorging that has been provided by their parents. The value of this food for the treatment of tuberculosis was being heralded quite widely in both Australia and New Zealand. In the primitive state of the islands, large quantities of the land birds were available, and because of the fertility of the soil and favorable climate, vegetables and fruits grew abundantly in the wild. Large quantities of fern root were used. Where groups of the Maori race were found isolated sufficiently from contact with modern civilization and its foods to be dependent largely on native foods, they selected with precision certain shellfish because of their unique nutritive value. The native diet of the tribes living in the islands north of Australia consisted of liberal quantities of seafoods. These were eaten with a variety of plant roots and greens, together with fruits which grew abundantly in that favorable climate. Few places in the world have so favorable a quantity of food for sea animal life as these waters which provide the richest pearl fisheries in the world. This is evidence of the enormous quantity of shellfish that developed there. Another important seafood in these waters was dugong, referred to as sea cow in northern waters. This animal is very highly prized but is becoming scarce. We found its meat very much like lamb. It lives on the vegetation of the sea floor in shallow water. Before we draw any conclusions, I want you to understand two things. You might have noticed that all of these native populations have absolutely beautiful teeth and no tooth decay and no problems in the development of their teeth or jaws whatsoever. None of these tribes religiously brushed their teeth like modern human beings do. None of these tribes used chemical-based toothpaste for their teeth. None of them used any mouthwash. None of them used any fluoride. And yet, their teeth are perfect. Luckily for us, Price also photographed the modernized counterparts of all of these tribes who were eating modernized food that we usually find in the supermarket. In the modernized counterparts, Price found you, and me, and everybody else in modern society. He found degeneration. Not only did the modernized counterparts have severe dental problems, they also had disease, they also had developmental problems. Their faces looked very different. You might already suspect where I'm going with this. This is a secret that the medical establishment has been trying to hide from us 
for over 100 years, and it is that these native populations had no prevalence of disease whatsoever. The development of the dental arches, the teeth, the jaw, the facial structure is just a reflection of an individual's health. Naturally, nutrition is not the whole picture, but this is where we need to start. We need to start with the food that makes human beings healthy. Through SNA Price and Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, we can start to draw conclusions about what these healthy native populations ate and what we should be eating. The base and focus of all of these diets is animal foods, not necessarily the muscle meat, which is the type of meat that is glorified by carnivore dieters and meat enthusiasts alike. Although most of these native tribes used all parts of the animal, it can be said that they preferred organs. They naturally knew through taste and experience that the organs of the animal and the fatty tissues in general are the most nutrient dense and lead to the strongest offspring and the best health. This primitive wisdom is 100% scientifically correct because today we know that the organs of the animal are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. We should also realize that not all native populations ate cooked meat. Many of these tribes ate raw meat, including the Native Americans. The most notable example is of course the Eskimos, who almost exclusively ate raw meat. Most of the tribes that Weston A. Price studied ate plant foods. Yes, the bulk of their diet was animal foods, but they also included plant foods. And this is very wise, because plant foods contain substances that are not found in animal foods. But the biggest reason as to why plant foods were eaten is because plant foods were available to them. In fact, this is the most important takeaway. Humans have always eaten whatever is available to them. The reason the Eskimos did not eat as much fruit as the Polynesians is because the Polynesians had access to fruit, while the Eskimos did not. It goes without saying that these native populations didn't just achieve their superior health by eating natural foods, by eating nutrient-rich foods. They also avoided all modern processed foods. Luckily for them, they hadn't access to this food yet. It was unavailable to them, so they didn't eat it, and their health was spared. Unfortunately, we human beings and modern society have access to this modern poison. You now know the effects of this food. You can see it everywhere. You just hadn't seen it yet because everybody is affected by it, so there is no comparison. In this book, in Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, there is comparison. You now know the effects of modern food. You now know that it controls the population, dumps us down, makes us weak. And you have the choice to eat healthy for the rest of your life. If you choose modern poison, you deserve the consequences. We were all born into modern society. We've all been brainwashed into thinking that cake and cookies and all of these foods that are available to us are a good part of life. That we're lucky to have these foods around us and that they provide us with happiness. That they're an integral part of everybody's life and that anyone who doesn't consume these foods is crazy or abnormal or is too strict or is unfun. Modern human beings have been conditioned into thinking that if they don't eat all of these foods that are available to them, they're losing out. They're missing something, when in fact, it is those who eat fast food, who eat fried food, who eat cookies, who eat cake, who eat all of these foods that are poisonous to human beings, that are losing out. They're losing out on their birthright, their health. Break free from your conditioning. Break free from your chains. You have to realize that if it were not for toothbrushing and toothpaste, all of your teeth would have fallen out by now. If you're 20 years old, your teeth would have fallen out. You would look exactly the same as these modernized counterparts who had all of their teeth fall out. Realize that although toothbrushing has saved your oral cavity, the rest of your body has not been saved. You have developmental issues. Your face doesn't look the way it should. Your teeth are not placed in the places that they should be. Your mind doesn't function correctly and you 100% have organ damage. You have certain rules that you need to follow. If you break them, you'll be just like the rest of them. You'll succumb to modern degeneration. But if you follow these rules, 
and you abide by nature's laws, you'll be rewarded, you will blossom, you'll be healthy, you'll be happy. Here are your instructions. Look at your genes and try to mimic the diet of your ancestors. Learn more about nutrition and improve upon the diet of your ancestors with our current food availability. You have access to many foods that many of these tribes would have loved to access. Try to find them and try to eat them. Make sure the base consists of nutrient-dense animal foods. If you have very mixed ancestry, you need to make sure that you experiment. Even if your ancestry is very clear and you come from one place in the world, you still need to experiment to see what works and what doesn't work. Nutrition doesn't take one day. This is an area of life that needs to be mastered and it takes time. Now let's see if you've understood the message of this video. What do you think is healthier? Animal fat that is filled with cholesterol and saturated fat? Or sunflower oil and low fat diets? Which population is eating what? And how healthy are these populations? On a final note, these things are not taught in school because modern society doesn't care about you. Modern society simply wants to use you to fuel itself. That is it, to fuel the people at the top. Your unhealthiness, your lack of knowledge is what fuels this entire system. In all honesty, I don't like to tell people to like these videos or subscribe or share the video. I want you to do so from the bottom of your heart without me even saying anything. If you feel like the message in this video is important and that more people need to hear this, then if you do all of these things, YouTube will make sure that this video is shown to more people. With that said, thank you. Thank you for being a strong human being. You affect more people than you can imagine. And the stronger and healthier you are, the stronger and healthier all of the people around you will be. Go and achieve excellent health. I wholeheartedly believe in you.